We set out with six research questions we wanted to explore within the project, which included understanding how traditional storytelling techniques have evolved for the virtual environment, where stories can be truly witnessed all around you. How the feeling of being there contributes to the knowledge of and engagement of the people and situations reflected within virtual environments, as well as exploring the impact of how different platforms might affect virtual documentary experience. Next slide. As well as exploring the ethical implications of virtual encounters, the challenges that arise when we don't have a shared grammar for virtual experiences, which involves such a wide range of interdisciplinary stakeholders. And finally, looking at the emerging business models in order to support virtual reality documentary production. Unfortunately, we don't have long in this talk, so we can't cover all the aspects we've achieved in this project. So we're only gonna highlight just some of the work, including our pathfinding commissions, some of our studies, both lab-based and in the wild, as well as the ethical considerations of virtual reality. Next slide. But before we do so, it's not often that you get to see a new art medium develop from the very beginning. So when the project kicked off in autumn 2017, as good researchers, it was important for us to start off by doing our secondary research to understand what non-fiction pieces have been developed in virtual reality non-fiction previously. However, to allow us to understand and reflect in its early days of adoption where virtual reality non-fiction was potentially heading. Next slide. Before we knew it, we were creating the first comprehensive history of English language non-fiction virtual reality, our virtual realities mediography. We did have to send some inclusion criteria for the mediography. The pieces had to be presented in English, but we did also accept subtitles in order that we could then analyze them for our research. We also accepted any title that presented itself as a work of non-fiction, documentary or journalism achieved through textual description and or inclusion in the non-fiction content program, such as a documentary film festival. And they also needed to include a title card, production credits, or both. Next slide. The analysis of the mediography was accepted and received an honorary mention at ACM SIGRA, SIGCHI in Glasgow in 2019. For those of you that aren't familiar with VR nonfiction, in 2019, the journalist Noni de la Pena was working as a research fellow at USC's Mixed Reality Lab. Noni was looking at what she called later as immersive journalism. She took verite audio from particular events and created a virtual environment to resituate that audio and allow an audience member to take part or at least be a passive observer in those experiences. In 2012, a major piece of work that came out of this called Hunger in LA, and it was the first piece of VR nonfiction accepted for an international film festival. When they took that piece to Sundance, they needed to have something a little bit more robust in technology rather than the prototype just stuck together with sellotape and string. So she called upon her intern at the time, Palmer Lucky, who eventually evolved the prototype and went on to form Oculus. Next slide, please. Since then, VR nonfiction content market has grown significantly, and we've identified just over 600 VR nonfiction titles produced between 2012 and 2018, capturing associated media such as the director, year of release, content theme, and duration. As can be seen by the graph, as Oculus continued to develop and was joined by other VR platforms, artists and filmmakers around the world started to experiment. We are still finding and cataloging more VR nonfiction pieces for 2018. So the dip isn't quite true in this graph, but it definitely does feel like there's a slowing down of the curve in the creation of nonfiction pieces. This plateauing may be due to the VR nonfiction producers exploring other areas of VR content production where audience demand is currently higher, such as VR games, as well as current challenges we've documented in our producer interviews, 
around securing funding to make non-fiction pieces. As currently the business models of VR non-fiction production are not stable with little current funding available, which does limit the draw for new producers to get into making VR non-fiction pieces. Next, please. VR non-fiction is typically on average short, currently around just over eight minutes long. VR non-fiction pieces have, however, changed over time as piece of people experimented with what made a good length. With producers creating pieces from one minute to about 50 minutes in duration. At some point, the comfortability of an HMD, however, wins out. So it's unlikely we see lots of feature length films being the norm in VR anytime soon. Next, please. VR nonfiction creators are exploring a huge range of themes in their work. Our theme browser in the mediography visualizes how these themes interlink and cluster, identifying leading topics being explored through VR nonfiction. The most popular theme being war and conflict, followed by nature, art, and history. We can also see from the mediography that currently about 49% of VR nonfiction pieces are being created in the US, followed by 20% in the UK and 8% in France. Next. We also wanted to carry out an in-depth analysis examining a representative sample of VR nonfiction which we'd found. So from our repository of over 600 titles, we examined 150 in more depth. That's about 23 hours of footage. And we took great care to have a variety representing the full corpus of the mediography, covering the first six years of VR nonfiction history, including 360 videos, CGI pieces created using games engines such as Unity, award winners, and those that weren't. We also made sure that we didn't focus on a particular genre of content. We classified the viewer's role in each of these pieces using the Dolan Palette's existence influence classification scheme. The scheme classifies the role of the viewer across two dimensions, defining two levels for each. The first dimension, existence, describes the degree to which the viewer is made present, i.e. how much they exist as an actor within the virtual world. Either the viewer is observant or a participant. The second dimension is the influence which describes the level of control that is afforded to the viewer within the story. Either the viewer is active or passive. As you can see, passive observance currently dominates nonfiction VR with 63.9% of the pieces being classified as this. In contrast, the number of active participant pieces are very small indeed. Next. After we finished the Dolan Palette's classification, we analyzed every single piece using a bottom-up inductive coding approach. Our analysis resulted in identification of 64 characteristics grouped into 10 categories. I'm just going to pick up a few. 360 live action currently dominates VR nonfiction with a whopping 73% of titles. The most common viewpoint is the objective omniscient viewpoint which is very common in 2D documentaries, despite what is promised. Very rarely do VR producers place you in the shoes of others. This isn't necessarily a terrible thing for presence. The use of direct eye contact with the viewer is still very effective and can heighten immersion as people in the scene addressing you directly, especially in first person experiences. Most VR nonfiction pieces we examined are trying to use the full 360 space, which means that utilizing successful ways of manipulating the viewer's gaze are critical. Thus, we need to use gaze manipulation to guide the viewer's gaze in order to guarantee, well, hopefully, that the viewer will see what you want them to see. But what we can see so far is that VR nonfiction, the majority of the pieces use prompts by an actor within the scene to guide the viewer's attention. There are a variety of other techniques, for example, you can use moving objects to direct the viewer's gaze by staging natural moving objects or using saliency, whatever is biggest, brightest moving people will tend to look at. 
Other interesting methods of game manipulation in VR include spatialized sound, placing audio in specific locations in the scene, making people automatically turn to where the sound is coming from. However, it should be noted that audio is currently very underutilized and advances in fields such as binaural audio should provide exciting further opportunities to bring users into the experience they are finding themselves in. We can only experiment and try lots of different things. Eventually, VR nonfiction will evolve its own language, frameworks and guidance to say what works and what doesn't. Next. As with any new medium, it will only move forward and only become more advanced through experimentation and by increasing the variety and volume of different stories being told in its space. So we wanted to make sure we gave a safe space for VR teams to try to experiment with this medium. Next. With the support of Watershed and Hannah Brady, we launched a VR non-fiction experimental prototype commissioning call where we had three lots of £50,000 production budgets to award a crate VR non-fiction prototypes. We were lucky enough to have over 150 applications from all over the world, including award-winning producers. We wanted to seek research in three original works that would be bold, distinctive prototypes to engage deeply and creatively with the potential of VR for don documentary and or journalism. Those commissioned worked closely with the research team so we could capture their process of production, their challenges, their successes, and share the findings with the wider community. We're also keen to hear bold ideas from creative practitioners from different disciplines, those that hadn't had the opportunity to experiment with VR, particularly those whose voices are currently underrepresented in the sector. In order to achieve this, we had two distinct pathways for submissions, an open call for those experienced in VR and a new voices call for those that hadn't had an opportunity to work in VR before. Next. We were delighted to commission three new bold and distinctive VR documentary works based on their originality and innovation. Selected from the open call was a piece called Transplant by producers Oscar Raby and Katie Morrison of the Vertov Studio. Transplant is set in Chile under the dictatorship of General Pinochet, centering on the ideas of biologist and philosopher Francisco Varela as he undergoes a liver transplant. Transplant asks us to consider through interactive VR the relationship between body and mind. Their ethos is that the operation or interaction in the experience should be used as a device to actually tell the story and to understand who the main character, Francisco Varela in this case, is. Understanding him and the narrative by engaging in the interactive operations in VR. Their approach was less about telling a viewer a story in VR and more about the letting the viewer themselves discover through their in own interaction with the story. Next. The two other projects which were selected from the New Voices call, filmmaker Lisa Harewood and creative technologist Ewan Cascavana created Love and Seawater, which addressed the legacy of separations between parents and children that have been a feature of Caribbean economic migration. Love and Seawater took a participatory produce approach to production, involving those affected by this theme in the development of the VR treatment of this previously invisible aspect of global migration culture. Lisa and Ewan's final target audience was always at the forefront of their narrative development and the VR design decisions they made. From the outset, they had determined that they not only wanted to create a piece with, but also for all of those that have suffered from separation due to Caribbean economic migration in order to bring new audiences into VR. Their piece is polyvocal, capturing two points of view from those of the parent as well as the child, using audio captured from participants in the co-creation workshops they ran, and it was entirely used CGI. Next. Also new to VR was the award-winning writer, artist, and director, Victoria Mappelbeck. 
working with Shahani Fernando and Darren Emerson, her project, The Waiting Room VR, tells the story of, of her own breast cancer journey from diagnosis through to treatment and recovery, mixing both verite audio and narration. The project explores cultural myths and language of chronic illness, asking us to confront what we can and what we can't control when our bodies fail us. It is a personal journey, but as cancer affects one in two of us over the course of a lifetime, it also tells a uni very universal story. Waiting Room with VR was selected to premiere at Venice Film Festival in 2019, going on to win the Storytelling Award at the International Documentary Film Festival at Amsterdam in 2019, and was named in the top 50 XR experiences by Forbes. I'll now hand over to Danai, who's going to talk you through just some of our experimental studies. Hello everyone, um, I'm Danai Stanton Fraser. I'm a psychologist from the University of Bath and um, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, some of the experimental studies that we have carried out uh, on the project. So uh, we've carried out four studies. Next slide, please. Um, two first studies on empathy, uh, prejudice and pro-social behaviour. And the second uh, study on viewer synchrony in VR, I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail because we have results on those studies. Um, but we've also uh, carrying out a couple of studies at the moment, one on co-presence in VR with the BBC and another one on the waiting room that Key has just described, um, one of our commissions. And so I'll just uh, give you a flavour of those towards the end of my part of the talk. Next slide, please. So, um, Nonfiction producers have embraced VR, making a raft of immersive projects. And however, this is, as Key was mentioning, a nascent medium, and there's been little research into the creative affordances that it provides content producers, um, or indeed the responses from audiences. And a very significant influence on the development of virtual reality uh, nonfiction is summed up by Chris Milk's 2015 TED Talk, which many of you will know, um, sort of touting VR as the ultimate empathy machine. And the idea is that by giving a sense of presence in VR and being spatially transported into a scene, uh, perhaps being in somebody else's shoes, that VR can provide this identification with people and thus empathy. However, the term empathy is commonly used, but often quite vaguely defined. Uh, with cognitive science, it's commonly defined as the ability to share and understand the experience of others. However, in common usage, the terms are often expanded to include concepts such as sympathy and compassion, and is seen as the cause behind sort of positive social uh, behaviours and decreased stereotyping and discrimination. So the idea that VR could provide a powerful new medium for boosting empathy and um, pro-social behaviours is a common theme among early VR um, adoption in nonfiction. However, there has been critique of this. For example, Kate Nash um, has proposed this improper distance between the subject and the viewer. And she talks about the risk of trivialising the suffering of others. And Paul Bloom has questioned uh, this focus on empathy and talks, for example, about um, the empathy being the foundation of moral interactions actually leaves this um, our behaviour prey to a host of cognitive distortions. For example, we might tend to feel more empathy towards specific individuals, but not to groups of people. And along with these theoretical issues, there are also a number of practical issues with examining the power of virtual reality nonfiction to boost empathy. And one of those um, that's particularly uh, strong is actually the um, types of measures that we might use. So um, they tend to be questionnaire based measures and um, researchers have report, use self-report most of the time in their desire to uh, look at the way that um, non the nonfiction, sorry, the empathy has been um, uh, examined. And so motivated by these sort of issues about the measurement of VR and um, empathy and thinking about um, how uh, VR might affect wider social attitudes and behaviours, 
uh, we decided to set out on a study looking a bit more broadly than just empathy, but also looking at prejudice and pro-social behaviour. And today, there's just one study that's investigated this by Shoot and Stilinovic in 2017. And they looked at uh, this uh, UN piece, uh, you can see an image of on the slide, Clouds Over Sidra. Um, and they got people to watch this documentary of a young Syrian girl living in a Jordanian refugee camp um, in a, in a head-mounted display. And they had two versions, one just very briefly, uh, one was fully immersive, and one was a cropped view, but still within the headset. And then they measured immersion with the questionnaire. And they found uh, higher levels of empathy for the refugee girl compared to their control group. Um, and this led us to start thinking about this study uh, was very much um, a questionnaire based. It actually um, was quite a small scale study and we would have liked to look more at implicit as well as explicit measures. So we decided to run a much larger study uh, looking at a combination of these factors. So we were interested, for example, if VR can affect implicit plus explicit measures, whether um, it could drive changes in attitudes based on immersion, or it might be the sense of agency, or maybe it's a combination of the two. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so we carried out this lab-based study, oh, sorry, next slide. We carried out this next uh, lab-based study and we had um, participants uh, in four, in two conditions. It was a two by two design and immersion. So it's head mounted display versus tablet and agency. So they were either 360 and they could view whether in the tablet or the head mounted display, or they had a fixed point of view onto the environment. And then we took measures of um, explicit prejudice through questionnaires, but we also then did the um, implicit bias test. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, it's called the IAT and we adapted it. So for example, you'd have images of um, British people, I I images of um, uh, Arabic people, and then you might have um, different um, words, good and bad, and you associate them and it's a time test. So um, longer response times indicate bias. And we also looked at pro-social behaviour, so we were interested in this idea that um, it might promote pro-social behaviour and particularly donations. Um, and so we looked at this by um, asking people if they would donate at a, a later date uh, to the project. Um, and um, next, oh, sorry, I should say people came to, they were, First of all, they uh, did the uh, questionnaires in a pre-session, then they came to the lab, watched the um, uh, documentary, and then uh, they carried out uh, a number of the tests, and then they came at a delayed time a couple of weeks later to carry out the tests again. Thank you. And what did we find? Well, we found, um, very interestingly, that uh, that even controlling for pre-session scores, there was no effect of viewing condition on implicit prejudice um, in either the experimental session or the follow-up sessions. Uh, so that was the IAT, the, um, uh, the uh, sorry, the measure that I have just mentioned. And then uh, we found the same for the explicit questionnaire. So there was no effect um, between conditions of the explicit questionnaire and the same for pro-social behavior. So we found that the viewing condition didn't significantly affect uh, the money that people donated. So you can see in the graph that people donated about four pounds, regardless of the condition that they were in. We also did do a measure of empathy following up on the previous study, um, but we didn't, in, um, in a, uh, we didn't find any effect um, of empathy, uh, even though they did. So in general, our results suggest that the use of 360 degree um, video as a medium for content delivery has no greater effect in reducing uh, prejudice or promoting pro-social behaviours than more traditional forms of media such as the tablet that we were using. I think it's worth pointing out, though, that, of course, uh, and as says at the top of this slide, what we did find was that the um, bias on the IAT 
did decrease overall. So there was less bias after watching the documentary, but it didn't matter which format that you watched it in, whether it was on the tablet device or on the head mounted display. Um, so the, so actually the, the documentary was having some effect, but actually the form in which you were watching it wasn't. And I think there's, a, there's obviously a caveat here as well, um, that this is 360 video that tends to be, be used in this uh, by filmmakers uh, for documentary, but actually there's considerable research that suggests that more immersive forms of VR, particularly those that give viewers the sense of being embodied, being able to feel or control the body of someone, perhaps in, in lots of studies from a different ethnicity or gender or identity, are much more effective in changing attitudes than perhaps more basic uh, forms of virtual reality, such as the ones we uh, explored within this study. Next slide, please. I get to move on now to talk about the second study. So our second study was on attentional synchrony and in the recent uh, mediography that uh, Key just mentioned that we carried out, it suggests that three quarters of all Engli English language non-fiction VR content um, is predominantly 360 video. And because of this, it presents a challenge um, that audiences don't miss content because they've got this full 360 um, field of view. And this has led to people asking uh, for the development of a new screen grammar and thinking more about the geometry of storytelling. So in this context, an increased understanding of how people visually navigate through 360 videos has the potential to yield quite important insights for both content producers and, um, and uh, people working, technology developers working in the area. So we carried out a study to examine the um, high emo whether the high level of immersion provided by head mounted displays encourages participants to synchronize their attention during viewing. We um, had 64 participants um, who watched the documentary Clouds Over Sidra, so the same documentary that we've just been talking about, either in the headset or the flat screen condition, but obviously they had full field of view. And Chris uh, on the project developed a customized video player that, um, that we could use um, to play back the, the recordings. Next slide, please. Um, and what we did was we used intersubject correlation analysis to measure the attentional synchrony over the course of the video and to examine whether spatial and temporal factors led to different amounts of correlation, both within and between the groups. Next slide, please. And what we found was taking time points across the entire doc documentary, um, the intersubject correlation was higher in the head mounted display group. So we compared the intersubject correlation across scenes. So we looked at and categorized the scenes, you can see these at the bottom of the slide, into unidirectional, intermediate, and panoramic scenes. And then we um, and what we found was a higher intersubject correlation in the unidirectional scenes. This interacted with device and with stronger effects for the head mounted display than for the tablet. And the other analysis we did was we compared the intersubject correlation from 10 seconds at the beginning, middle, and the end of the scenes. And we found greater intersubject correlation at the start compared to the middle and end of scenes. And this interacted with devices as well, so it's stronger for the head mounted display. So our, oh, we also did, um, I, we also, I had it on the other side, we also did an, um, a measure of engagement. And what was interesting about this was that we found that the intersubject correlation was a positive predictor of participant scores on the engagement questionnaire, suggesting that participants whose viewpoints overlapped more with those of their fellow participants found the documentary more engaging. Um, next slide, please. And, oh, sorry, I haven't finished a little bit. And in, in terms of our findings, we suggest several possible strategies for the last study, which is seeking to maximize the um, synchrony between viewers, um, thinking of things like, for example, if you look, if they, finding the finding of the stronger um, 
attentional synchrony for unidirectional scenes compared to panoramic scenes it makes you think about the type of uh, information that you might have in the scene and also that the findings of the stronger um, attentional synchrony at the beginning compared to the middle and end of scenes might suggest what that content creators could think about when they uh, do scene transitions, for example. So those are the two studies that I have data for. And then I'd just like to very briefly tell you about a couple of studies that we have um, that we're working on at the moment. Um, and the first one is a study that we're carrying out with the BBC. Uh, BBC R&D and particularly with Ma Maxine Glancy at the BBC and it is looking at co-presence and we're particularly interested in the psychophysiological effects of watching an immersive documentary with co-present individuals across viewing platforms and this um, idea of um, synchrony and co-presence has recently been dem demonstrated um, when people share a common experience, particularly in sort of live experience, live performances. Um, and what it shows is that um, sharing this common experience is enough for cardiac, cardiac synchrony to occur spontaneously um, and that it increases as a function of a shared and coherent, explicit emotional experience. And we wanted to investigate whether this held true for the extremely immersive but arguably isolating experience within a virtual reality headset, virtual reality environment. Um, so we're carry, we've carried out a study, um, we've got pairs of participants uh, who are recruited together, seated side by side, um, and they watch the uh, Darren Emerson's um, piece, Indefinite, and while they're watching, we have, they're wearing an empatica wristband, which measures their heart rate and galvanic skin response. Um, we have some questionnaires, but interestingly, after the documentary, what we do is we replay um, their experience and they rate their emotional valence and arousal um, in a replay task. And we have a semi-structured interview. And unfortunately, like, um, I haven't got any results for you yet, but we're busy working on those at the moment. Um, and then last but not, uh, not least, um, we are carrying out a final study, uh, which is on the waiting room VR that Key mentioned as one of our commissions. And what it's doing is investigating um, the, <coughs> excuse me, the viewer's sense of identity and mortality. So we've got a long running research interest in spatial cognition research. And Victoria's piece was grappling artistically with how the viewer should experience her journey through cancer treatment, whether it should be as first person or as a close observer. And actually, the waiting room, you can see a picture here, um, is filmed in a sort of ambiguous style in which viewers are positioned close to but not in the shoes of Victoria, the film's subject and director. And our aim with the commissions was to feed in relevant research through our joint workshops that we had together, and if possible, to study the resulting prototype. So our current study seeks to make use of the ambiguity of the viewpoint um, presented in the waiting room. And what we're doing is we're manipulating the viewer's position. So the study manipulates the posture. So somebody, uh, one um, group of people will be sitting upright in 90 degrees um, in uh, and carry out the study, or they'll be in a declining chair of 150 degrees, which is consistent with Victoria's pose uh, here. And participants watch the documentary in one of these two positions. Um, we're also taking, uh, there's more to the study that we probably haven't got time to describe, but we're also taking measures of things like um, empathy, presence, um, the self, um, and um, that study is currently underway. Uh, it's actually been stopped uh, temporarily due to COVID, but just started up with COVID um, uh, you know, restrictions and things in place. So we're going quite slowly through it, but we are looking forward to getting the results hopefully over the next couple of months. Um, and what I would like to do is I'd like to acknowledge Harry, Eliana and Chris, who've all carried out an awful lot of work on these studies. And I shall pass to Mandy now to talk about the household study. Hi. So I'm Mandy Rose and I'm the co-investigator at the University of the West of England in Bristol. 
I'm going to talk about two pieces of work, um, an audience study and work in progress on the ethics of VR documentary that we're in the middle of now. So next slide then, Chris. So while there's been much enthusiasm for VR nonfiction among niche audiences at festivals and a growing body of critically acclaimed work, some of which is freely available to the public, mainstream audience interest in VR nonfiction in the wild has been underexplored and VR hasn't been set in, in the context of the other media that people consume. Um, so we decided to adopt households as our framing to explore how this media platform fitted into the life of the home. We posted an open call online and we worked with partners to recruit a cohort of participants, a socioeconomically and culturally diverse group, 35 participants in 12 households. When people first try VR, it's often a very powerful experience. There's a whole kind of subgenre on YouTube of people trying VR for the first time. But we wanted to understand what people made of it beyond this initial reaction. So we took a longitudinal approach, giving people kit um, that they had at home for up to 10 weeks. We created, curated weekly programs based on themes that emerged from the mediography. Here you can see on the, on the, on the left, the program around the natural world and on the right, um, human migration. Other themes included space, which was very popular, world cultures and immersive journalism. Within each theme, we selected five to six pieces in a variety of formats, including what some people call linear VR, where there's little agency or uh, few options that the viewer can choose, and in, as well as interactive pieces. We uh, included a combination of 360 video, CGI work, and hybrids of the two, and pieces of a range of durations. Uh, the collection included several award-winning pieces of work, and given that some of our participants were as young as 13, which is the youngest age that the industry recommend for VR, all the pieces we offered were suitable for a pre-watershed audience. So here's the equipment which we gave each household. Centers around an Oculus Go, a much more user-friendly headset than the tethered versions, which luckily for us was launched just in time for our study. Um, it was preloaded with 46 pieces of curated VR nonfiction content. And you can see other things in that box too. Um, uh, when we brought the equipment to people, we recorded the discussion as they unboxed the equipment, hearing how they reacted to the VR headset and to play down the hype that has surrounded VR, we popped in a couple of precursors so that um, to give people a sense of the history behind the headset. You can see the view master and the stereoscope. So next slide, Chris. So here you can see research associate, associate Dave Green who ran this study at that unboxing meeting. So we were taking a qualitative approach. Our aim was to listen carefully to feedback from a mainstream audience to discover what insights they had to offer about VR nonfiction and to understand what new directions these might suggest for research and for practice in the field. We kept in touch with participants through WhatsApp. We set up a group for each household, sent announcements for each week weekly theme and asked open-ended questions once a week. After a minimum of 10 weeks, we returned to the households and conducted a 90 minute semi-structured group interview. The questions were orga organized into six sections, patterns of usage, content, social aspects of VR, perspectives on documentary, ethics and usability. Um, so I'm going to come to the findings and I'm really just skimming the surface of, of this work here. Um, there's an article coming out very shortly. I'll tell you about in a moment. So participants vividly conveyed their sense of being immersed within the frameless media space of VR. And their comments suggested how the affordances of VR enabled their feeling of connection to the documentary content to quote a couple of those um, pieces on the screen. One says, to actually feel like you were in the middle of thousands and thousands of people. And another, VR helps you understand real world problems. You see it from their perspective. 
arguably the characteristic affordance of VR is what's known as presence. The optical illusion that, that, are, um, that comes from being surrounded by this media, um, surrounded your, around your head, um, through your eyes, um, that leads to a visceral sense of being there within unfolding events, even while you know that you're sitting at your desk on your sofa or wherever. So here we see um, Khadija, that's a, a pseudonym for a, a, our anonymous participant, saying, in the story of water in Pakistan, where the community were gathered outside of their house and they were kind of coming up with different ideas of how to clean the water, you feel in that moment that you are sitting next to them. So this illusion of proximity to events and locales in the historical world that VR can offer strongly aligns with the observational mode or rather the impulse behind the observational mode within documentary. It's the feeling of being there, which is also uh, the title of direct cinema pioneer Richard Leacock's 2011 autobiography. So many, um, many participants suggest that the VR experience offers them what Mel Slater calls an illusion of place and an illusion of plausibility. Um, so, yeah. The Oculus Go offers limited interactivity compared to high-end head-mounted displays and room-scale experiences. However, participants noticed what was possible and relished what agency they had. Here's one, what one of them said. I liked how you could explore the story in a different way because you're a participant you can choose which angle you see. Um, across the interviews, there were frequent comparisons between VR and the experience of content on television. And without using the terms immersion, presence and agency, participants made it clear that they felt VR offered something that the flat TV screen couldn't. However, the power of the VR experience was also seen as a potential drawback. Um, people had concerns that the content might be overwhelming or triggering of past trauma. The vividness of VR made it very persuasive and the sense of being there elided the construction of the work and the directorial point of view. More than one participant worried that VR could be a platform for propaganda. Um, People also felt vulnerable in the VR headset, especially if they were alone at home. So what have we learned? Um, participants from all households across all demographics saw positive potential in virtual encounters with real people and places. Um, they found that these, these affordances of VR um, offered documentary values and pleasures. Um, they had reservations though too, as I've said, around the power of VR and its potential for trauma, persuasiveness, propaganda. Um, but uh, but the, despite all the, their enthusiasm, what was really marked was that their usage of VR dropped away very dramatically. Seven out of 10 households stopped using the VR equipment by the end of week two. Only two we're still, we're still um, trying the VR pieces into the eighth week. Um, and they talked about how the impact of VR um, had a negative or conflicted with the life of the home. Um, it didn't, as, as TV does, they, they said, it didn't support conversation, uh, sharing, the sociality of the home. Um, so, so we concluded that um, VR at this point lacks what Brian Winston calls supervening social necessity, the social context that takes an innovation into the mainstream. So here are the outputs from the study and we have, we have we've, the, the, the article about the study, kind of 10,000 word articles just got through peer review and will appear in Convergence, the journal Convergence in a couple of weeks online. Um, we're also gonna be writing this up in, a, in an article for Immerse News that'll come out soon. 
So um, finally, I'm going to say a few words about some work we've been doing on VR documentary ethics. Um, it's work in progress. So ethics is a challenge for VR producers, you know, with um, emerging, emerging platforms, changing platforms, multiple um, versions. Um, there's a lack of guidelines, a lack of regulation, and it's a very fast moving field. How can producers behave ethically um, in a field that's so new? How can they gain informed consent when they're not fully aware of what the implications of participation might be for participants and subjects of documentary? So we've engaged in some collaborative work around ethics. Um, and I'll offer you just a few headlines. Uh, this is a workshop that we held in the boardroom at the BBC, um, we sat under a huge portrait of Lord Reith discussing um, the ethics of VR documentary. Uh, a group of us, over 30 people, producers, um, researchers from a range of disciplines and some policy people too. So the context of this investigation is the context that Dan, I and Key have alluded to, that context that in which um, VR kind of burst onto the scene, surrounded by these ideas about empathy and about pro-social, the pro-social potentials of the medium. Um, and, and there were also clear, there are also vested interests in this area. Um, uh, um, uh, um, for example, here we can see uh, Facebook's VR for Good Creators Lab their initiative that supports VR documentarists, um, but also encourages them to use their Oculus products. Um, we can think of documentary as a relational practice in which um, the triad of producer, subject, audience are at its heart. Um, and VR brings new problems across each of these axes or, or new challenges. Um, just thinking about the producer and subject, we can think, this is unfamiliar tech. Um, how legible is it to the people taking part as subjects of documentary? Thinking of the, the capture process and the 360 video camera. Do the subjects recognize that, that that camera as a camera? Do they know when it's running? Thinking of exhibition. Will people who are, who are filmed for a 360 video piece even see the finished work? Um, so we, oh, sorry, no, stay there, Chris, go back one, sorry. So we've been thinking through the implications of VR documentary for those, for that triad of relationships. We've also been looking at VR ethics from the point of view of the human sciences. Um, in 2016, Michael Madary and Thomas Metzinger, philosophers of mind at the University of Mainz, published this extremely important article, a code of ethical conduct, conduct which looks at VR both from, uh, and ethics from a point of view of research, but also from a point of view of, of mainstream usage. They identify a number of challenges, two of which are very pertinent for VR docs. Um, so the first of the two is risky content. Um, they're thinking, uh, Madari and Metzinger are thinking about uh, VR from a perspective of psychology and thinking about how human beings are very sensitive to their environments. There's lots of been, work, been lots of work in, in psychology that shows how humans are very sensitive to context and easily influenced by context. And we can think of VR as a context shift, um, that idea of being there uh, in the virtual environment. So this theme, this risky content theme echoes comments by participants in our audience study. Um, it's about the power of immersion and the potential for distress, trauma or persuasion. Um, and this area requires producers to be extra vigilant, thinking about VR content in a different way than how they might think about the same content if it was going to be presented on a flat screen. So those, these issues around risky content are now, have, have been escalating um, in the context of what Thomas Metzinger has called this year, technological confluence. We can think here about the combinations of media technologies that create complex um, contexts, psychologically speaking. So we might think of VR plus AI, VR plus deep fakes. Um, 
And meanwhile, image quality is becoming ever more hyper real. So the sort of potential for a kind of psychological realism in VR uh, grows. So here we're looking at images of Facebook research in which photorealistic avatars are am animated by the tracking of users' face facial movements within the headsets. So we have to think about VR as a recursive system which potentially responds to the user through eye tracking, uh, their speech, through micro expressions, and in multi-sensory and room scale VR through body and hand movements. Put these all together and we're looking at a potentially very powerful personalized experience in much VR, it's just you in there. So neuro, neuroscientist Patrick Haggard has, has recently raised a question about the potential of VR for false memory, for instance. Um, so, uh, yep. So, um, yeah, so, so, you know, this, this, thinking about these things is inevitably speculative, but if we think about the impact that social media has had on our lives and behaviours over the last 10 years, it seems important to be doing that speculation, thinking ahead, not waiting for some of these problems to, to hit us. So finally, on data and privacy, um, Facebook's Oculus is the dominant platform um, in, in VR documentary. Uh, but, and as we all know, there's a lack of transparency over data gathering and the use of um, what, what data of ours is gathered in general. But this kind of, this is um, even more significant in terms of uh, the headset, the VR headset. Uh, and these issues are escalating uh, with the announcement last month that o Oculus users need to sign in, new Oculus users need to sign in via a Facebook account. The overt driver here is that users are encouraged to engage with Facebook's social VR platform, Horizons. But the implication is that Facebook gets to join up all the social media, media data people have shared with that platform over the last decade plus, with the data that now, the intimate data that can now be captured via a VR he headset. So I've suggested that, you know, if, we, if historically we've had a triad in documentary, the triad of producer, subject and audience, we really have to start thinking now of a tetrad in which the platform owner is this kind of fourth unseen presence. So um, where are we going with this work on ethics? We're, we're planning to develop a toolkit for VR producers based around questions that they might ask themselves during the production process. This is ongoing work, which I've explored in depth in a recent talk for MIT Open Documentary Lab. We've got an article in draft and we're going to be publishing on this in, in Immerse News too. So um, thanks for your time. Uh, we're really keen to hear your questions and to follow up on any of this research, please go to our website.